welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand. I'm very happy to have uh, Kat O'Connor as our guest today in the studio. Kat's a very distinguished artist in the uh, area and uh, not, v distinguished for many reasons. She, not only is she a visual artist, but also a very fine poet and uh, an outstanding teacher. And uh, Kat, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, and I'm not kidding about you being an outstanding teacher. I hear such good things about you all, t all the time from various uh, people who have taken your classes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, where are you teaching right now? I teach mostly at Worcester State University. Um, I also teach at De Cordova Museum and Sculpture Park and occasionally at Worcester Art Museum. And these are all painting classes? Um, painting, drawing, cross-media, do a, a variety of classes. And how long have you been teaching in this area? Um, since I got here, 13 years ago. 13 yeah. years ago. <laughs> and that's a long story which we want to get into. <laughs> um, uh, you were actually born and raised in Massachusetts? Yes, in Holyoke. Holyoke, Mass. And, yeah. and then I noticed that you uh, did your uh, art studies in Montana and Texas. That was very intriguing to yeah. me. Uh, you mentioned your, meeting your husband, John, and I, I'm also a big fan of John's work, <laughs> yeah. and I wish he were here today. <laughs> so John uh, Hayden is your husband? John Hayden, Hayden yes. sorry. <laughs> and, um, and so you met in graduate school, and uh, tell us a little bit about John's work since he's not here. Um, John's art is fabulous, I think course I'm biased but um, he does a lot of collage he does a lot of conceptual work we were just talking about uh, he was working on his masters when I met him and he had gone to school in at Southwest Texas State University um, so we always feel like we had the benefit of three colleges between us um, in terms of, of what we learned about art and how we approach art um, and University of Texas at San Antonio is a very conceptually oriented uh, program so he benefited a lot from that a lot of his work is more conceptual now than it was when we met and just as an example of what we might mean by a conceptual work when I was over at his studio I remember seeing a work that he had made when you were away and I'll have to describe it for the audience but it was just um, a series of long black wavy hairs and it was put with a piece of tape across the top and put in a very nice presentation in a frame and it was called cat hairs and you know so you might be able to understand that the when we say a conceptual work it's not necessarily something that is about describing something but more giving an idea or uh, an experience or and I suppose he was missing you and uh, right, wanted right. to make that and my hair goes everywhere <laughs> and your him, hair so. must have been everywhere for him <laughs> yeah. to find when you were gone that's good so uh, and he works at the Worcester Art Museum too, he does right? he's a preparator there prepared yeah. do you have a lot of exchange and uh, in terms of what you're thinking about and criticism for each other's work and stuff like that? Yeah, we really do. It's nice to have um, a person who's both supportive but also pretty tough in terms of his criticism. So I know uh, when I get to the close to being done with a piece, I always show it to him and see, and he'll tell me exactly what he thinks about it, huh. which is good. Huh. It's, it's interesting because your work is so different. It's very you know, different. You're yeah. grounded in realism, and you know he's doing these very conceptual pieces so I was wondering if you had you know such different aesthetics right. that, that might be uh, good or bad it you know? really is good and because like I said I was trained um, a lot in conceptualism I it, certainly mm -hmm. that was my focus when I was at UT San Antonio um, I remember I did you a lot saying of years ago that you were trained in conceptual art and you really wanted to paint. <laughs> I did. I was dying I to paint so I had to finish school. Yeah. Yeah, so I could get out and paint again, which um, it, it is kind of interesting. I, I'm glad I had that experience. It was yeah. um, definitely Because art thing. is really a lot about ideas, whether you make realistic paintings or not. Yeah. It's yeah. really so much. And you were saying that yourself just a little while ago. Well, your studios were very interesting, and I enjoyed seeing all of his uh, 
collection of bones and things like that. And right. he's really uh, a Westerner. He's from Texas, yes, right? Yes, definitely a Texan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and you, oh, just briefly, it, does uh, where you live affect what you paint to a great degree? Or? I think where I travel affects what I paint. I like, um, and we were talking about my work being realism, but I always think there's a, a secondary level to that, to any painting, and that's the abstraction. And when I'm looking at imagery, I'm not seeking a subject, I'm seeking that abstraction. A relationship of shapes and forms yeah, and shape, color patterns. color, and, light, yeah. um, that's really what interests well, me. Well, let's look at a couple paintings because it'll okay. be easier for people to know what we're talking about. Um, Right. All right, and uh, so what do we have here? This painting is called Round Again, and for those of you um, that are familiar with it, this was an image that's based on Tower Hill Botanic Gardens, their lily pond there. So when I'm talking about a, a painting having two layers, um, the top layer, the, f the first layer, is um, what the viewer sees. If I ask someone, what is it a painting of? So you don't mean physical layers in the painting. No. You mean layers of experience. Of experience, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, so the viewer sees uh, flowers, lily pads, reflections in water, grass, that's that first layer. What I see when I look at this painting is the motion. So when I titled it Round Again, I wanted um, the viewer to see how the painting spins. There are all these circular forms in it, um, but then in, in addition to the circular forms, the overall pattern is a circle. Uh, the reflection of the fence in the water is a circle. So when I put these together, there are actually bits and pieces of different images, um, could be even different places depending that on the you painting. Combine that you combine to make the form. Yes. You're discovering a form which represents your experience right. or your intent. Right. Uh, you know, I always try to <clears throat> say that to students myself that you can paint a subject of anything, but you can say entirely different things with the subject by how you right. organize the elements. And that the visual experience on the deepest, most profound level comes from those abstract relationships of shape and color and movement and so forth. Right. Forth. It's, I think, too, it's the hardest thing for students to see. Yes. So this painting um, in the Blue Electric is also based on the same idea. So it's actually um, images from the Florida Everglades uh -huh. and their lily pads are a little different than ours. They have that kind of pointy quality to them. Um, and I was fascinated by how much the color could change and how the implied lines changed based on that slightly more arrow-shaped form mm -hmm. than the round form mm -hmm. of the lilies. It, it's also so difficult and amazing to see as an artist how a really dark, dark lily pad because of its glossy surface can be all reflecting skylight Light, and be right. very cool and white. <laughs> and, so that's kind of interesting. I also like the way they seem to be floating in space, almost like they're in the sky. So right. there's almost a double interpretation that they're in the water or that they're in the sky. Right. Or, uh, and I think the viewer in a painting like this is, is allowed to see that a little bit more. It isn't literal. Um, so you have to look at it in a slightly different way. Um, which I think as artists we do manipulate the viewer. We try to um, tell them what we're working towards. Mm -hmm. um, so this painting not being quite grounded uh, gave me the opportunity to do that. Yeah, it really, to me, is not grounded at mm -hmm. all because you feel you're in the sky almost. You know, the right. sky is so, so uh, obvious. Really deep space is what it looks like. <laughs> it's amazing, uh, very interesting. Uh, this painting, Tamiami Spin, is also from the Everglades, um, and it has that very dramatic dark line on the left. Yes. And that was, it's actually, um, was based on reflections of the walkways that they have going over the waters. There's alligators in these So <laughs> little boardwalks. <laughs> yeah, the, the boardwalks. Um, and I was fascinated with the idea of breaking up the space with that very, um, architectural sharp element, um, but keeping it in the context of the dark water and the reflection. 
I love the juxtaposition of that geometric shape on the left. Mm. See, the other is just sort of flowing and all doing this, you know, whereas this one, that's such, uh, such a surprise, mm -hmm. you know, such a, an anchor. And it really creates a very interesting composition, which is kind of like an L, you know, with the bar and the crossbar. Uh, and then the little box of sky, you know, it's a little box of sky. Right. <laughs> Interesting. I like also <clears throat> the rhythm of the lily pads. Uh, the, you know, our audience might want to notice the way you organize the cool tones of the leaves or the, the, red, the redder uh, colors of the small uh, round shapes and how you move the eye through the painting you know how your eye sort of connects like things and jumps from place to place. Right, and that circle is repeating here too again. I like the circular pattern. Um, you can follow it through the reds, you can follow it through the greens, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but then they're anchored by that mm -hmm. vertical line. Mm -hmm. Very true. This is actually a watercolor. Those were oil paintings, um, and it's based on lily pads that I I was teaching a class up in Maine, uh, right outside of Acadia and in Acadia, and um, I found this pond, it was completely fascinated with the jumble of, they're sort of half rotted leaves. Um, some are very green, some are very pink, and they had these long tendrils going under the water of So red. these are lily pads as well? They yes. almost look like fallen leaves from yeah, autumn, yeah. floating on the surface. Uh, I, again, I love the composition of the large mass at the right, just balanced by those three or four little leaves on the left. It's mm -hmm. kind of that asymmetrical, almost like a Japanese kind of composition. Right. Um, you, you were saying this is a watercolor. Do you, uh, you seem to be accomplished in every medium, <laughs> but... but uh, I blame my students on that. <laughs> because you have to know it, you right? You do. Well, you have to know it, but also I find I'm sitting in the studio and they're doing watercolor or acrylic or oil, and I'm jealous. You know, I want to try it. I want to do it myself. So I go home and I, I uh, start doing paintings. Playing so around, Yeah, so yeah. I have a lot of... And it's a lot of times when I'm beginning a new series of paintings, what I'm really thinking about is, do I want to work in gouache, acrylic, oil, um, as much as how do I want to approach this subject. <laughs> so it's fun to have a lot of different media, but. Yeah, and, and the, I always find that switching media prompts a lot of new kinds of ideas and imagery and because the media kind of lends itself to, you seem to be doing a lot of watercolor though. Is that something that especially appeals or? Um, I, yeah, I love watercolor. To me, watercolor tends to be a medium I do when uh, when I'm teaching during the, the school year, college school year, um, because I can go in and work for 10 minutes or five hours. Um, whereas oil, I really have to dedicate a couple of hours to do. You know, do. I find that a problem, really, yeah. in my own work. And I tend to do more watercolor work because you can go and complete something or get an idea on the paper you yep, know, yep. in a shorter period of time. Yeah, yeah. It's true. So I do like it for that reason. This oh. is a watercolor. Um, this is called Line. And this was, uh, we're talking about travel and media. Um, this is an image from Skopelos, Greece. And oh. it's a, cla a class that I've taught several years. Um, and I'm fascinated with the idea of media as it relates to subject. Um, what I find is that when I teach in Greece, I've taught in Italy, those are definitely watercolor locales. <laughs> because of the light? Because of the light, yeah. And then I teach in New Mexico, and gouache is what I really love. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because of the um, sand and I stone? I think because of the, yeah, because of the immensity of it. The, huh. the, the landscape and the, is so and the physical. the heaviness of it. Yes. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, and you're looking at these orange cliffs, but they have purples and yellows and greens. Um, so I just find the gouache with the layer, the ability to layer works a little bit um, better for that yeah. scene. And but it wouldn't be good in Italy. And instead of something transparent, <laughs> like the waters and skies and instead of something transparent and luminous in the desert you're looking for something sort of clay and opaque yes. and yeah and solid heavier almost. solid yeah. and heavier yeah good good point yeah. 
Um, well, this painting is the same idea. This is an oil also, um, and that's Moore State Park, if you're familiar with that, out in Holden. Um, Holden or Paxton? Paxton. Um, and this is a watercolor, green and gold. See how luminous and translucent that is? It just has a shimmer, like a stained glass window feeling, mm. you know? Um, I thought this related really well to uh, the poem I'm going to read to you now. Look at the little patch of blue sky that somehow is contained in the mud. It's just wonderful there. That's a poetic reference there itself. <laughs> okay, let's, this is called? In the Green Cathedral of My Ordination. Prearranged like Christ, but face down, showing the waxy memory of skin veins replaced with words, free from the fox who invented consequence. I cannot be saved from the sweet pea and fern in the room that is the day forgotten. Wing song, mosquitoes, too late for blood, buzzards, too early for flesh, and the doe, as usual, more attentive than lovers. Love, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I, I really love the uh, title of that poem. What is it again? In the Green Cathedral of My Ordination. I couldn't help thinking um, how nature, my, my dad always used to say, this is my cathedral. You know, if we walked in the woods, he said, this is my cathedral, because the, you know. Right. And it, it is a really spiritual experience, and you seem to get a lot of your inspiration from nature and even the animals. I and, do, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think when you're looking at a painting like this um, and reading a poem like this, it isn't a literal, uh, it isn't a narrative, it isn't about that place, it's about that type of emotion, um, that type of feeling. And of course, when you're talking about poetry or painting, they can both come from the same place, but they give us different ways of thinking about it. Um, so it isn't an illustration, so to speak. When you look at a piece like this, what prompts the, uh, it, like did you walk there and see that and then that prompted the response that made you want to make a painting of that? Yes, it was mm -hmm. literally that feeling of being, going through deep woods. This was um, an area in Maine that had some marshy, almost bog-like qualities mm -hmm. to it, but it was in heavy pine. So you're walking along and all of a sudden you're, you're in this opening that is sunlit. There's a little bit of water there. There's wonderful growth, all different types of textures. So it's the experience of nature, but also when you look at this particular formation of leaves, it's the formal design of these leaves and the way they stand out against the mud and stuff like yes. that. Yes, and it makes the, the quality of the light and yeah, very interesting. Uh, okay. I also like this one because it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have an anchor to me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the viewer can hang on to, it's a painting of a boat, it's a painting of a bird, um, but this is just stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I always think the best painting and is a painting And it's what we're of made of. It's what we're made of. It comes, it goes, it deteriorates, it regenerates. Right. Okay, let's see another. Um, this oh, this one I recognize. You have a piece in the Arts Worcester show right yes. now in, in uh, Biennial. Yep, and this is that piece. Um, this is called Pool Sabaday Falls. Um, and if you've ever been to Sabaday Falls, it has that same feeling that I'm talking about with green and gold in that you walk into this space and all of a sudden there's light. The water is this wonderful. It's like a transcendental experience. Yes, yeah, yeah. that yellow green and the <coughs> the way the light enters the space, um, I find really fascinating. You seem to really be very moved by light and yes, shadow yeah. and the way it works on form. Yeah, uh, and this is an acrylic painting. Okay, yeah. I'm afraid we've got to move on yeah. to this one. I want to hear <laughs> another poem. This is also Sabaday Falls, um, and that's an acrylic painting. And like I said, it's to me, it's literally the light bouncing off that water. The pattern onto the wall. of light and dark yes. is so striking. Yeah, um, and this one actually started as a watercolor. So a lot of times I do a watercolor underpainting, and oh. then I do acrylic on top of that because I find that, like we talked about, the the watercolor has the ability 
to maintain a, a crispness and a translucency in the lights, whereas acrylic goes very cold in the lights um, without a, a lot of control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is a combination of both. Okay, let's go, okay. and I wanna hear this one Okay, too. so this is Ferry Street Mill, East Hampton. Very different subject matter um, on the surface, but also about the abstraction. But I grew up in Holyoke, around a lot of these mills and, and, and fabulous buildings that are abandoned, basically. Um, and the thought of all, you know, I always think, oh, that would make a great studio, um, those big windows. So this is a, a poem once again, it's not an illustration, but it's along the same theme, and it's called Mill. The vine growing through the brickwork dictates who will be allowed to enter. He should be long and lean, willing to flake paint from walls red with warning. He should be willing to drop the river three stories below until it is a spill through a valley, a ripple caught in glass. He should be willing to rebuild and lose his wife because she will believe the man in the bar who says he's been struck twice by lightning. Oh, I love the geometry of this one too. Mm -hmm. And I can just imagine a long, tall figure. You were saying the doors were really right, slow. You right. had to crawl through some. <laughs> and the whole idea of the deterioration and regeneration and nature kind of reclaiming. Taking it over, very, yeah, yeah, yeah. very quickly. What else do we, oh, um, I love okay, these. Yeah, yeah, these are, it seems like a big jump, but um, I wanted no, to talk didn't. about um, the drawings. Actually, you had requested to see. I love these. Some I of saw these. these at the uh, sh show at Worcester State, the faculty show. Right, right. And these are extremely large um, graphite drawings. Yeah, so they're, they're almost they're like life size, aren't they? They're almost life size, yeah. Um, and they actually came out of a trip to Italy. Um, and looking at all of this, this work by these fabulous artists who are really controlled in their subject matter. Um, and how much passion there was for the art making. So this is Bartholomew and he is, St. Bartholomew um, was flayed, uh, which means that his skin was removed from his body while he was alive. And that's a horrible subject <laughs> matter. Um, but what fascinated me about it was it was an opportunity for the artist to discover anatomy, play with anatomy. I mean, I'm fascinated by bones and muscle structure and, and what makes some, something move or a, a shadow change on a human form. So this was actually based on a sculpture in a cathedral in Milan. And there are hands throughout um, the waves and the water that are based on Bernini sculptures that I saw while I was in Italy. And I love the idea of the hand, the artist's hand, um, and why we make art. What I love about it is the way it asks so many questions. It's, it has a narrative to it, obviously, mm -hmm. but yet you can't quite put your finger on, it's not like an illustration of a story, because the story is kind of open-ended, and uh, very, uh, but it's beautiful graphic quality, too. Let's see another. Um, this oh, is this car is lovely. crash. Yeah, this is the, the um, about the same size, um, and this is me. I had started a series of pool images, both poetry and um, visual works, probably 20 years ago, um, and this, this is sort of an accumulation of that project. So I'm gonna read Marfa Mystery Lights in that okay. little kind uh, of Okay, by twist. the way, I love this image. To me, it's just so full of mystery and... Okay, Marfa Mystery Lights. You set up the telescope in dry grasses and Russian sage, everything tan and brown, but the sky shifting in oil blue colors to dusk. We are skeptics our first night in the desert, having stopped in Hondo to remove a kitten from the center of the highway. Three men bet from plastic chairs, dead in the east lane, the west lane, dead on the yellow line. I left the kitten on a porch and rang the doorbell as I walked away. Telescoping tripod legs, knobs, and the bend of your back in orange twilight, more things die in the desert. I find a tiny jawbone, a dry sheath of transparent skin holding a skeletal hand. In the dust by your feet, I assemble a beast, 
mostly vertebrae, the perfect hand, angel wings of armadillo scales white and square as teeth. You look at Venus, then readjust for Earth. We are looking for the lights that appear from nowhere, belong to no one. They are there. They rise from the desert floor, move along and disappear. I see a woman speaking to a dead child, green vapors soft and gently moving. I see a fox carrying a lantern and a man who is lost. Later, I lie wet on the concrete apron of the pool, blue water the only light in the desert. Bats skim the surface to drink, wings brushing my skin and echoing sounds I cannot hear, the things I will never tell you, the secrets I will never tell myself. Next night, we return to the lights without your telescope, sit together eating the sweet leather of tamarinds. Well, we could talk about this one for half an hour, but unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Could we see the last couple ones yes. and then... Uh, so all of these come out of that idea of the pool at night, and, and that started in the desert in Marfa. Um, oh, that's so nice. And that's a painting I finished three days so ago. So you're doing a lot on the pool and, uh, and those yes. lights in, in... Where was that, in Texas? Texas, yeah, Marfa is in Texas. That must have been Texas. quite an experience. It's and, amazing. Uh, it's an amazing kind place. Kind of a mirage yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I hate to stop, but uh, we are out of time. And uh, I want to thank you very much for coming today and sharing your work with us. And uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, it. Sue. <laughs> and I want to <laughs> ask the audience, too, you know, realize how many wonderful artists we have in the area and how many cultural events are happening. The Poetry Society, ha the Worcester County Poetry Society has uh, lots of readings. and So come on out and uh, take advantage of some of the cultural experiences that we have in our area. And uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next time for another edition of Arts and Ideas. Mm -hmm.